Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Lev. I'm not Bargav, uh, unfortunately. Unfortunately, Bargav couldn't come today. Uh, but my name is Lev. I'm the maintainer of GenSim. So I'll give a talk on word embeddings, which is not going to be topic modeling, but still going to be GenSim and natural language processing, things like that. This is the repo called <coughs> Movie Plots by Genre. Today, we'll analyze movie plots and automatically find a genre using word to vec mainly and tried several other tools. Yeah, so please find the repo and clone it. It's, it's a, it need, it, there's some notebooks inside it. Some of them already have output, if you want to cheat, or you can just find notebooks. Some notebooks don't have output. The main ones here called document classification word embedding. Yeah, <laughs> and this is the one you should follow through. There'll be, if you want some surprises. Uh -huh. Yeah, I can, I can, I'll write the, I shorten it as a URL, so I'll, I'll write it on the board right now. Little R. B. B and R. Cool. And just Google movie plots by genre. That's easier. <laughs> cool. I didn't know it was so famous. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, some slides have come with this. Slides. Cool. Okay, so how much time do we have? When are we supposed to finish? At, at 30 minutes? <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah, we could do it in 30 minutes. That's possible. So first, uh, you know, I'll st yeah, so my name is Leah, I'm community manager, like, you know, you don't probably care about me much. Uh, the, I'll, I'll do two parts today. First one, I'll do some theory of word to vec, and secondly, we'll run some code. While you're cloning the repo, while you're, you know, setting it up, then I'll just do some talking. Cool, so GenSim, how many of you have used GenSim before? One, two, three, good, it's a tutorial, so that's, that's the right level to be at. Uh, so GenSim is this open source topic modeling and word embedding project. You know, we have about 500 academic citations now. And at the same time, we have a lot of industry adopters. So we have, you know, like Cisco, Amazon, this kind of people use this software. And this is a very nice place to be at intersection of industry and academia. We take some paper, look at the code that comes with the paper and has, you know, variables called A, B, C, no comments, like nothing like that. It's written in C. And we try to make it into a Python code, which is maintainable, you know, has nice variable names, you know, actually some comments, and something that people can maintain over the years and use in production. So that, that's what we do. Um, yeah, like most of this stuff is done through our incubator program with students. And Vargav, yeah, Vargav is here. Yeah, this is Vargav, who's supposed to give the tutorial this morning. And, you know, we have more students. If there are students here and you want to work on open source, please get in touch. You just get free mentoring from us, half an hour a week of Skype with one of our team. Cool. Uh, this is not related. So I'll talk about word to vec today and why would you care about word to vec algorithm? And mainly because it's magical. Like this is a magical application of this algorithm. Somebody took a lot of restaurant reviews. This is a company in San Francisco and they have about 2,000 restaurants in this small city. And they found out things about restaurants just from reviews. There's no notation, just completely unsupervised learning. So they come up with this recommender. So you could start with vanilla steakhouse and say, I would like something more jazzy. And you get a, have a vanilla steakhouse plus a vector for jazz, and you get a steakhouse with live jazz. Or you, know, you start with vanilla steakhouse and add something with a scenic, you get steakhouse with a view. Or you want to add a vec from start a vector for a usual steakhouse and add a vector for a patio, and you add a vector, you know, just end up with something that has a patio. And patio and a view are two different restaurants, of course. I didn't know this, but yeah. And the other uses for this technique of word embeddings, you know, you can automatically tag the text as we're going to do today. Today we'll ha have a movie plot come in, and the outcome will be a genre of the movie plot. It's going to be romance, action, or drama, or something like that. 
Uh, you can also use for recommend recommendation engines, and you've just seen with the restaurants. Uh, you can also do it for search query expansion. Originally, this algorithm came from Google, and Google used it for expanding the search queries. You know, like when you type something and it asks you, did you mean something else? That's words of is one of the things working behind the scenes here. Machine translation, you know, or just plain feature engineering. There are many uses for this stuff. Cool. So the, the notebook that is available at this URL, um, Movie Plus by Genre, this is what it does. So imagine if you run a movie studio and you have thousands of proposals for movies and you need to classify them in some way. You need to send them to the right department for consideration, you know, like one department per, per genre. And this is a, you know, artificial problem. In reality, every time I give this workshop, there's somebody in the room who classifies its resumes or CVs and to decide, you know, which job they should go to. You know, this is a Java CV or this is a Python CV. You know, what is this? A data scientist CV, what, what, where should I send it to? Or like somebody might uh, classify spam this way or, you know, support forum uh, requests. There's so many applications how we need to classify texts <coughs> into different fields. Uh, and then we're going to do one about Movie Plus because it's more fun. Cool. So the main tool we're going to use today is a word embedding. And what is a word embedding? The word embedding is just a way to assign a vector to a word. And you know, the easiest way to assign a vector to a word is, say, to have a vocabulary. So I have you know, a million words in my vocabulary. And I say that the word king is the word number one. So I just turn on the bit one, and the rest of them are zeros. And then I say the word queen is the word number two, so I just turn on the second bit in the rest of Nigeria. It's called one hot embedding. Only one bit is hot at the time. And this is OK. The only problem is that my vectors are one million long that way. They're very sparse. And it's annoying to, I mean, I, of course I can store sparse vectors in memory, but it still feels like a waste, waste of space. And then if I want to find if king and queen are related, there's no way I can do it. You know, I, like, it's kind of like I don't even know if there's any relationship between the words this way. So a word embedding or a word vector or distributed representation is this thing. This thing is much shorter, right? And only has three dimensions. I have like 0 0.94, 0 0.57, and 0 0.22. And here, um, I don't have a million dimensions anymore. I have only three. So it's much, much more dense, lower dimensional representation. And the reason it's called distributed is because the meaning is distributed across all the three dimensions. Here, the meaning of king is constrained in the first dimension, and the meaning of queen is constrained in the second. Here, the meaning of king is distributed across all the three. And the vector for a queen will be quite similar to this one. And then I can do dot products with them. I can do some kind of similarity measures between them and you know, see if words are related or not. So yeah, this is what we're going to construct today. Today, we're going to find some algorithms which will give me a good number. So like, why is 0 0.94 is a good number for king? Like, 0 0.57, like, why is it a good number? So we're gonna, today, we're going to talk about how to construct uh, this kind of things. Uh -huh. So you're using the whole space, and each dot will be a word? Is that what yeah, exactly. Each dot, each dot in this three-dimensional space is a word. But it's more like, not like each dot is a word, but each word is a dot. <coughs> because, I mean, it's a yeah, cont continuous, like real numbers and stuff. Um, Cool. So to do this, to do find out of good numbers, I need to know something about the words. You know, and the, yeah, I need to know something about my domain. I need to make some assum assumptions. And the assumption we use is a hypothesis from linguistics. It's called distributional hypothesis. And you know about a man, they say, like, you should know a man by the company he keeps. And the same thing about um, you know, words. You should know a word by the company it keeps. Uh, example, I want to find out the meaning of banking. A computer is never going to find the meaning of banking like we have it in our heads. All it's going to find out is that banking likes the company of government, likes the company of regulation, likes the company of crisis. You know, that's all we're going to find out about it. You know, I didn't know I'm going to be talking to Bloomberg. But yeah, <laughs> but yeah this is all we find out uh, that. And this is like idea from Wittgenstein that a word is just the way you use it. The word is by itself has no meaning. The word is just defined by how people use it. You know, if you use my name in different contexts, it will no longer be my name, for example. Yeah, and this is a, what the hypothesis we're going to use to create this vector. vector. And of course, you know, usual procedure to for come up with something in machine learning nowadays, you, you know, start up randomly, have some objective function that you improve on, and then do gradient descent on that until, you know, your boss tells you it's time to submit. <laughs> 
<laughs> and this is the objective function. I'm not going to talk about it more. Like our slogan is topic modeling for humans, like not for mathematicians. So like I'll do some hand wavy explanation of this. Like if you want to know more, just go to this course, yes to the 4D, or there's a nice uh, DeepMind Oxford course about NLP. Like just do that if you want to know more about maths. But this is you know too short time to talk about maths today. Cool. So the Let's pretend that I'm this algorithm called Vortovec, and um, I just see this sentence, the fox jumped over lazy dog. I need to make some conclusions about the words that I see. So I want to find about the meaning of the word over. And what I really do is just I have a bunch of probabilities in my head. So I have probabilities of two words appearing together. And if I see them appear together in the same sentence, then I bump them up. So I have over appeared as a friend of all these words. So let's increase all these probabilities. You know, probability of that given over is going to become higher. Well, the folks given over is going to become higher. So every time I see this, um, you know, every, every time I just see a, a word, I go through all of its neighbors and bump up these probabilities. And this is just a for loop, you know. I fix one, one word and for loop over all its neighbors and just bump up probability of, you know, over give, of they given over, of folks given over, jump given over, and they given over, lazy given over, dog given over, yeah, all these things. This is one for loop. And another for loop is just goes over all the words as a central words. And then I look at all the friends of the word there. So I get like a probability of they given there is higher, you know, folks given there is higher. And then I bump up all of them. And that's how it works. There's no neural networks or anything like that. It's just two for loops. You know, I just pick the central word, then go through all these neighbors. Once I'm done with the neighbors, I move to the next word and look at all the neighbors of that. And I just go through an entire data set that I have in the same in this fashion. You know, um, yeah. So the only tricky part here is to define this probability. If I have two vectors, you know, one list of three numbers and another list of three numbers, how to get the probability out of that? You know, do you have any ideas? Uh huh? So I have like three numbers here and three numbers there. So what should I count? Distance. Distance, like Euclidean distance. But it could be like, you know, from minus infinity, like it could be like minus 100 or plus 100. Like, well, it's not, it could be possibly positive, but it could be like zero to, to like 100 to 1,000. That's not a probability. But for like just the distance and the proof for the first sigmoid. Yeah, this is one thing that could work. Um, what they end up doing is taking a cosine distance. So imagine you first you, you take you have all these vectors in the space. First you project them onto the unit sphere. So make them all, you know, length one. So they all end up on the unit sphere. And on the sphere, I just measure the angle between them. And that gives me the cosine distance. And it's very easy to calculate. It's just the dot product. It's like the simplest thing you can do. You have, you know, three numbers here, three numbers there. Multiply the first one by the first one, second by the second one, third by the third one, and add them all together. That's all you do. And then you divide by the norm just to normalize it. Um, but what's the range of cosine? OK, so that's not probability yet. So now I have to do something about it. Like maybe sigmoid, but they just decided to do softmax. That was the simplest thing to do. And softmax tells you what's special between, you know, what's special between fox, if I have, you know, fox and jump here, and I divide it by fox and over, fox and there, and divide it by fox of all the other words. And I find out what is so special about fox and jump as compared to all the other word combinations that are there. And this is what softmax does for you. Just e to the power of dot product divided by the sum of all the other words, all the words. So that, that way I see what's special about this particular pair of words. That would be the probability of fox and jump appearing together. Cool. Do you have any questions so far about the theory? Mm -hmm. So the you know, so I start with some random vectors initially, and I have a objective function, and I see how it you know I, I do a pass over the corpus, and I see I see how well it fits, and uh, and it's just the usual you know back propagation that way I just have a correction just do gradient descent on, on that objective function, basically. So I just start somewhere randomly, and I slowly 
minimize my objective function. And by minimize objective function, I maximize the probability of words that I see appearing together. So I start, first I start, start up quite random. Then I calculate, you know, for fox and jump, I, ha I calculate this probability. And I see that it is lo lower than it should be. So I have to increase it if I see them together. That's sort of how the gradient descent uh, work. But specifically, the objective function is, yeah. Yeah, this is the objective function. You have this log of probability, where probability is defined using this, the softmax. And this is what I take the derivative of and do the gradient descent by. Um, yeah, did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. So just, you, as usual, you start up randomly, and then you do the gradient descent. <coughs> and there are some parameters, of course, like you have a learning rate and, you know, number of passes that you want to do over the corpus, just as, as, as it usually happens. So now, ha who has seen this picture before? OK, half of the room, good. <laughs> so, okay. so you know what Vortovec is. Like every talk on Vortovec ha must have this picture in it. And this is about this pink vector of femininity. So you end up with this cool vector where you take a word for woman and subtract a bit the word for man. So you end up with this vector which makes things more feminine. And I can go to king and make king more feminine, and I'll end up with queen. And this so is just a side product of this procedure. It was not exactly obvious how it came along, because we didn't really you know, optimize for this, but this is just a nice side product. And this is how these recommendations work in the beginning. You know how we had a vanilla steakhouse, and we had a vector for jazz, we end up with a jazz steakhouse. Mm -hmm. Like, wh what do you mean, how much is generalized? Like, two different kinds of analogies? Always in the sense of this directions, like like here it works for gender. Like does it work for rivers or airlines or something like that? Yeah. Um, it does work. I never seen a production system built with it. That's 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 the problem. Apart from this recommendation thing, which had you know handpicked recommenders specifically chosen you know jazz and view and patio, they didn't choose like any word that you can add to it. So it works quite well for these directions. It doesn't work well for you know antonyms, for example. If I add you know, two words of different meaning, what I get is kind of meaningless. So it is, you have to be a bit, you yeah, have to do some hand picking if you want to use it in production. That's true. Yeah, yeah but it's, it's, it's a good point. Uh, and it's not exactly explained what is the mass behind it that, we pr that this structure is produced. It's more obvious in GLOV than in here, in a different embedding. Cool. So, the algorithm I described just now is an unsupervised algorithm. And there's no labeling needed. You just fit, put some raw, da raw data into it, and this word vectors come out. Um, and Google ran it on you know, 100 billion of unlabeled words, just took all the news they could find, ran it on it for a long time, and put this model online. And this is one model that you can play with online. Um, yeah, you can go to this URL uh, and play it. Yeah. <coughs> so here's the example of you know man is to king as woman is to you know, queen. And you know yeah, you can do things like that. Uh, so Mm-hmm. Yep. So basically I want to find something which has a uh, closest thing. So I have to, you know, maximize, you know.
So basically, I'm, so I'm trying to find a maximum vector, well, let's call it you know, v, such that it's dot product with this combination of vectors, man plus king, um, yeah, woman, I think. Yeah, it should be like woman plus king minus man. Yeah, plus king minus man. Yeah, so the v, queen, is something which is close to woman, far away from man, but also close to king. And this is dot product. Dot product is linear. So basically, I want you know, v dot woman to be big. I want you know, v dot king to be big too. And I want you know, v dot man to be small. That's, what it, that's all it means. And I just find a maximum of this. I find. I just want to find a vector which is satisfies all of this at the same time. And it will be something, it's not exactly there, it's in the neighborhood of that, just like wherever, what is the closest vector in there? Right? Did, did I answer your question? Um, sort of. Sort of? <laughs> yeah, but it's not, it's not going to be exactly there. It's not true. Yeah, it's, it's just going to be somewhere in there. There's probably be the emptiness where it is, but around it, the closest vector will be that. But it's not just closest to that point, but it's you're really satisfying three conditions at the same time. Yeah, just from linearity of dot product. That's that's where the magic is. Cool. Um, do, do, can you guess what will happen if I put USA in here? Any guesses? Uh huh? Yeah, it stays. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a trademark lawsuit. Yep. Cool. Cool. So let's go. Okay, we have some. I think we have about 15 minutes to go. Let's go to some run some code. Um, has anyone been able to load the repo at least in in the browser? Okay. So we'll be able to load it in their Jupyter notebooks. Yay! Cool. One, two, three, four, five. Awesome. Okay. You, um, so <coughs> okay. Let me introduce the problem first. Um, So this is what we're going to try to figure out today. Like, what's the genre of the plots? So what's the genre of this plot, specifically? Can you tell me? Like, I want to see what a human baseline. You know, how good are humans at this task? Sci-fi? Um, this is actually, I don't know. Some of you might have seen this movie. Uh, it's from 1995. Yeah, it has Bruce Willis and Brad Pitt. And this is definitely sci-fi. Yeah, it's called you know, 12 Monkeys. And why I think it's sci-fi is because it talks about the future, you know, has some virus, you know, a planet. There's some specific words in here that make it sound like sci-fi. So there must be some signal in here. Like, there must be some hope. Like, sci-fi movie plots have completely different words from, you know, romantic movie plots. Yeah, like, and this is a romantic movie plot. Yeah, okay. I, I gave it away, but it is a romantic movie plot. <laughs> yeah, like, you can see that this talks about wealth, you know, about daughters about you know, match, and marriage, things like that. So there should be some signal in here. They should be able to separate it with, you know, with some kind of NLP technique. And yeah, it's called Sense and Sensibility. That is the movie plot, which, which is obviously romantic. Cool. Um, the main problem with this data set that we have is that it's unbalanced. And most things are comedy. Out of 2,000 movie plots, you know, most things are comedy. Another problem with it is it's small. Like, 170k is really small. Like 500k words is the minimum that you need to run decent word to vec model. Uh, so yeah, 200,000 words is quite small. That's that's the problem. Uh, but you know, for something to run on your laptop, you know, right here, it should be okay. Cool. Okay. So there, let's run some code. <laughs> Okay, I'll be I'll be cheating. I'll show you some not live running, but just some IPMB with output already. Cool. So this already you have seen. It's just you know just exploring the data, and so as a good data scientist, I will start with the stupidest baseline I can think of. You know, and the stupidest baseline. Actually, yeah, what's the stupidest baseline you can think of? If you look at this plot, what is the easiest baseline to come up with? Everything's 
I work in this company. And what's the accuracy of that? Like, that gives me already like 40% accuracy. Yeah, like 40% of my stuff is already, already comedy. So that's already good enough. That's what I'm trying to beat, 40%. OK. Next stupid algorithm in LP is just bag of words. And bag of words just counts how many times does <coughs> the word love appear in, in my plot. How many, oh, you know, and if it's a lot of love, then probably be romance. Or how many times does the word you know, future appear? If it's a lot of future, it'll be sci-fi. It's all I do, just count the words in my plot. And you know, that's what I try to do. And in the end, I just do logistic regression to figure out which, which part it comes into. And my features are like that, like adventure, adventures, adventures, you know, Africa. These are the words that I'm going to count. I'm not going to count all the words. I'll only count the most frequent ones, because they probably have more information, but not the very frequent. And that gives me accuracy of, uh, what does it give me? Yeah, it gives me accuracy of 42%, I think. Uh, people who are running it, have you been able to reproduce this? I think. Oh, yeah. I think the, just, just the counting words gives me 42%. And, but this is 46. And 46 is because I do TF-IDF. And does, does anyone know here what TF-IDF is? OK. Uh, cool. So I, this probably still needs some explaining that, uh, you know, if, if, I, if one movie plot has the word love appear five times, but the movie plot is, you know, 10,000 words long, probably doesn't mean that it's about love. It just, if it's five, only five times appears, that's not a big deal. If the movie plot is only 100 words long, if it's really small, and the word love is five of them, that's it's actually really important. <coughs> so that's, TFIDF is a way to adjust it by document length. And also, I adjust it by how rare or frequent this term is. Just a more clever way to count words. And that gives me better accuracy. You know, it gives me 46% accuracy. And I use this simple sklearn uh, TF-IDF uh, vectorizer um, uh, thing, where I only look at uh, words that appear in two documents. It appears in less than two documents. I throw them away. Um, yeah, and I use the English stop words. Uh, stop words are just the words that have no meaning. The word, well, they have some meaning, <laughs> but it's, uh, for, for a movie plot, they don't have any meaning. Like the word there, or the word like, <laughs> they are stop words which appear a lot, very frequently, but doesn't mean, don't mean anything special. So just throw them away. The standard technique in NLP to throw away stop words. Um, this is the confusion matrix for uh, this thing. So, you have, have you, has anybody seen like has anybody not seen confusion matrix before? Wow, that's the wrong way to ask a question. Okay, yeah, <laughs> but this is a confusion matrix, and it's very nice for a classifier. Like any time you're classifying things, just plot it, and you can see this is what my model thinks on the horizontal axis, and true label is uh, what the actual true labels are. So, sci-fi is quite blue. It means that a lot of actual sci-fi's went to sci-fi, and comedy, you know. Comedy to comedy is quite blue, but my model also thinks that animation is comedy. And probably animation is actually comedy. It probably means I should go back to the business and tell them, why oh, your label is not right, and you know, <laughs> six months later, we might have to come to some, some agreement. Yeah, so this is a real problem. You know, animation and comedy are the same, but I have to predict them. So, <laughs> yeah. so my, my labels are not so good. That's what I can tell from this uh, model, from, from, yeah, from this graph. Maybe it's just because my model thinks that everything is comedy. Like it sends you know, action to comedy and sci-fi to comedy. So maybe it's just being lazy. It just thinks that everything is comedy and laughs at everything. <laughs> maybe that's the problem. Cool. So this is my one baseline. Um, so now I want to use Vortovec. So let's come to the punchline of the, this talk. And I showed you how to get a vector for every word. But now we have 100 words. You know, Future, planet, and they all come together. How do I get a vector for them? How do I put, I have to get something that I put in the classifier. So do you have any ideas? Like how do I get one vector out of 100 vectors? I can evolve to the scientist. You should know how to do the average. You know, that's like the first thing I do if I have 100 things. Just do the average, <coughs> just do the average of them. And that actually works quite well. Um, I mean, I wouldn't, I, you know, sometimes you can even get this thing where you can just add all the words in a book, and then you get the main idea in that book. Yeah, okay, let's try it, actually. Does it work in reality? 
Um, so, yeah, if you just, it's, um, yeah, I have some code for that. Um, so this is when I tried to do this, and it didn't work. So this is my movie plot, and these are the main ideas which are in this movie <coughs> plot. So you know, OK, so this is about some piano teacher, and it's something romantic. And somehow, I see the main ideas just and but and in. Like, that's, that's meaningless. What happened to the stop words? Yeah, exactly. What happened to the stop words? So there's an exercise, you know, remove stop words. So if you remove stop words, you get the actual, like, get love and be cooler and, you know, more interesting words. So that, that, that's the exercise that you can try at home. Um, just do this thing with removing the stop words. And you'll get something much more meaningless. But these words are meaningless to me. Yeah, but, and if you remove them, you'll get something meaningful out of it. Cool? Um, yeah, and that's, that's the summarization OK. It will give you only one word as the main idea, not like two or three. It's not going to be like an actual title or header, just a you know, gist of that. And then, like, for example, Yahoo uses this for search query disambiguation. They just, you know, do the words for every, every, everything you put in the search query, every vector for that, average that, and figure out what's the main, main intent of, the, of their search query. Like the arithmetic mean? Just arithmetic mean. Yeah, just arithmetic mean. It's all quite linear here. Like, because of that relationship, it's, it works quite well. Because if I want to find something which is close to, you know, three words, if it, like, you know, just say, like, woman plus king, has to be something close to woman and close to king at the same time. So this arithmetic mean works quite well. Uh, that's because of the linearity of uh, dot product. You're away word order. No. Yeah, there's no word order really. There's only the context, like you know, have a word and this are its neighbors. These are ten neighbors. I don't know which one is closer, which one is further away. There's no waiting in there. Yeah, it's a, the word order is mainly thrown away. This, apart from the window, like the window is like minus five or plus five, and I'll give a talk on Sunday about how to choose the window, uh, the window parameter in your word to vec. Like, you know, if you use a big window, a small window, you actually get different meaning of this, of the words, of the vectors. This will be a Sunday talk about how to tune your word embeddings. And yeah, if, if, if you're around on Sunday. Cool. Um, there is, this has all been quite, you know, naive um, way. Like, the average is kind of a silly thing to do. There's a more advanced way to get vectors for documents. I'll just go in it over like the next last you know, two minutes, and then we'll go into questions. And it's called doc to vec It also came from Google, uh, from the same authors that did word to vec paper. And there, you actually, it's like it becomes sort of semi-supervised. <laughs> During training, I have to tell it what's the genre of, my, of this specific movie plot. But it's not the only objective. You know, it has to come up with vectors for words, and has to come up with get vectors for comedy. So it's um, it's it's quite as it's not completely supervised. It's com completely unsupervised. It becomes a semi-supervised algorithm. Um, yeah, it's probably confusing. I'll not uh, forget about it. So I have this idea of tags, and tag is a word which is in every context in the doc. So, for example, I say this is a comedy plot. Like the fox jumped over lazy dog. It's a funny sentence as a comedy plot. So every time I look at uh, a context of the word of the word fox, I actually will have uh, over as its neighbor, but also will have comedy as its neighbor. And comedy is, will become a vector in my space. And you know, same way as so I have, uh, yeah, like I have you know, king living here. I have the word comedy living here. And then I also have you know, comedy tag living here. And I'll have like a special. So this will become a special vector in my space. It just will live there. And there's a way I can arrive on them and to figure out that they're close uh, to one another. Just to have, you know, yeah, okay, just, just, just a second. Um, and the way I arrive at these vectors is just, you know, by doing the for loop as I did as I'm doing before. You know, just go through every word and say that its neighbors are, you know, over in comedy this way. Yeah, there's a question? See, I have a word comedy, and I have a comedy tag. So 
So it's lives, it lives in the same space. It's a, it's, a, it's a vector, but it's not the same as if you know, I had you know, the comedian jumped over lazy dog. It's, I will have a, uh, so I'll have to, it's, it's in the same vector space, but it's not the same as the word comedy. It's just in separate, it's called a tag, and it's fit in a different way. Uh, yeah, it's in the same space. Like I, it's actually quite nice that they're all in the same space because it means I can see which words are closest to comedy. And I, huh? It's a different color. Yeah, I use a different color. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, and also moves comedy around. They both move. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So it just has a different color in there. And it is quite nice that they all live in the same space because I can do things like, um, you know, closest words to sci fi. So sci fi is this tag, and I can see what are the closest words to it. So I can see that alien, you know, express, space, like this, words that describe sci-fi. And this is quite nice. I can get descriptions for them. And I can have as many tags as possible. I can have, you know, uh, some tags, you know, can be a username or, you know, you can make them into, as, tags can be anything. You can have, you know, 10 tags to the same um, text and find out information about it that way. Just, it's a very descriptive thing to do. So I can see which words are closest to sci-fi. But, and I can also see which genres are closest to each other. So this is, I only look at the red vectors here. So if I forget about the green words, only look at the red ones. So romance, closest thing to romance is fantasy. That makes sense, you know, it's just fantasy with, like, fantasy is like romance with elves, you know, basically. And then, <laughs> yeah, action is really far away. And that makes sense, that action is far away from romance. And this is done on just a small 200,000, you know, words data set. That's way. Cool. Yeah, I really like this thing that closest, you know, words to romance. That's just like, yeah, it's just like millionaire and local and hair and things like that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is what defines romantic genre. <laughs> yeah, question? So I only end up with uh, uh, this. Uh, six special vectors. So I only have, yeah, out of 2,000 plots, I only get six special vectors. So this is one way to do it. You can also do it for every document. It's possible. You have like document one, document two, document three. And then you can have descriptions for that. That's also possible. Um, it just doesn't give that many, that, that good results in here because the documents are quite short. Like they are not long enough to find, yeah, find out so something about them specifically. Yeah, yeah, I could have like, you know, uh, doc one tag in here. Yeah, and doc two. Yeah, it, 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 I could do that. Yeah. Have you used that in your projects somehow? <laughs> kind of. Kind of? Okay. <laughs> I see. Yeah, another question? Yeah, like co comedy, comedy animation. Yeah, I can have as many as I want. Yeah, I can have like doc one. Comedy, romance, you know, yeah, I don't know, Lev likes it. Yeah, you can have like anything you want to that. Yeah, the number of tags is not, is not limited um, to this. Cool. Um, do, do, do. Yeah, and Dr. Vec gives me something slightly better. It gives me 52%. So the stupid deadline, everything is comedy, was 40. And if Dr. Vec, this fancy thing with tags, I get 52%. So this is better. You know, it still thinks that everything is comedy, like this is really blue. It still sends everything to comedy. You know, it takes uh, about 25 seconds to train in Gensim, Dr. Beck. Uh, it's just one line, you know, just give it the sentences, say use two threads, uh, 100, use 100 dimensions, that's how long my vectors are gonna be, size 100, do 20 iterations, and, you know, and, and use the DM algorithm. And then I just do the, the problem is prediction. At the prediction, the prediction time, have a new vec I have a new plot that comes in, and it's just a bunch of uh, words. It just has the green tags in it. And I have to come up with the red tag for it. And that's, that's where it's annoying. I have to run gradient descent to find out what's the best uh, red tag that fits it. I actually have to do this objective function, minimization, 
again, to find out what it is that, 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 that works for that. Um, and <laughs> if you run it several times, you get different vectors. So like this, you know, this 52% accuracy, like sometimes I get it 42, sometimes I get it 67. And just the changes every time you run it. Because, I mean, if you train it well, if you have a big corpus, everything is fine. But this is a tiny, you know, toy example, and it's, it's annoying. You have some randomness at prediction time. Like, how many classifiers you know that at prediction time get, you, give you random results? Like, n not so many. So this is peculiar here, but if your model is big enough and it gets stable and, you know, it all gets fine. Sorry, uh -huh. um, you said that the words would translate them into a 3D text. Like, this is a 100 dimensional this time. Like, They're, they're all in the same space. So the documents are 100 long, and the words are 100 long as well. So they both live in the same space, 100 dimensional it's space. The three dimensions was just an easy example before, because I could like, talk about it. Oh, so typically, it's typically it's 100. Yeah, 100 is the typical auction number. Yeah. That's what was in the first paper, and since then it became the standard thing to do. The Google uh, one has been trained on you know, billions of words. That's 300 dimensions. Um, the one that you know the sort of king, man, and queen. Yeah. Is that randomness in performance due to negative sampling built into your training procedure? It's just just to do with uh, gradient descent, <coughs> really. There's nothing else in there. It just we have a. Just, just it's just just like any other gradient descent works. Like you have a learning rate and you try to you know take derivatives here and you you know just decide which which slope you're going to go down and you and mainly it's initial uh, initial in initialization is random so like how do i f come up with a have a new plot come in say you know like doc one and i want to find out where does doc one fit and i, initi I randomly initialize it here then i start moving it around and if i initialize it somewhere else i would probably end up with a different you know local minimum um, yeah, just the problem is random initialization of, of gradient descent algorithm. That's, that's where it is. No, uh, negative sampling, yeah, does add some randomness. But it's not, not, not in the prediction of Dr. Beck. It's in a, in a, in a different case. Uh, cool. So, okay. So we have like one minute to finish, right? Am I correct? Are any organizers here? Huh? Extra I have extra time? Well, let's, let's do extra time for questions and just finish now. So if you look in the notebook somewhere at home, you find more a bunch of other advanced algorithms here. And you see that what, they, what we get from them. And the best one, the winner, is this averaging thing. Just take the words and average them. That's, been, that's the winner. If you give me whooping 58% accuracy. Like, not 40, as everything is comedy, but 58. And that's not very impressive, you know, like, I heard about neural networks, they do amazing things, you know, and even for loops can do amazing things, like, why doesn't it work? And the reason it doesn't work is because you have to tune it. You need a lot of data and you have to tune it. And tuning any, each one of these algorithms will take another, like, hour and a half to talk about just all the hyperparameters that it has and how to choose the right window size, right iterations, and alpha, and all these things. And, but out of the box, you don't get nice results. If you want to see nice results, you can read a paper which shows you 98% accuracy. And, you know, they spent two months you know, tuning it. That's, that's, that's the, you know, the short outcome of this, um, of this talk. You know, the training time is not really that big for most of them, and prediction time is only bad for like one, one of these algorithms. Cool. Um, mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, and just a multi-class logistic regression. Just have you know five, six genres as my output. And do you do any regularization on that? Uh, I think I do use some regularization, yeah, for that. Just beca because I have a lot of them. Okay. Yeah, I have a regularization. Mm-hmm. Just just 300 numbers, input, and put in logistics and logistic regression, and it comes out. Maybe if I used random forest, I would get something better. 
just wanted to use something <coughs> qu quick you know, as, as a classifier. Like, Yep. There are some dimensions in there, and it's sort of, and it's still uh, this average vector is still exists in the same 300 dimensional vector space as everything else. And averaging works quite similar. Like if I want to see the average of woman and king, I'll have something which is close to woman and close to king. So it's, I can still look at the neighbors of it and the summarization. For example, we saw this summarization where it gives me the main meaning of the. Of, this, of the plot. And that's exactly, I just took, take the average of them and t find what's the closest words to that average. So there's some, still some meaning in there. However, if I do PCA, this will, this will improve. Like if I do PCA before uh, doing the classifier, this, this will improve. So th there are some, some meaningful ways to get more meaning to, to the dimensions. But, uh, but the general is rotation invariant. And when it f first comes out, the cosine is rotation invariant. Just put them all in unit sphere, just look at the angle between them. I don't really care about orth orthogonality uh, in, in, this, in, in here. If I run PCA, I get better results. Uh, well, uh -huh. So you've got your, 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 your training data with your, your vector, mm -hmm. your uh, label, whatever genre you already have for those functions. Mm -hmm. You also talk about adding a genre as a special tag. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, this is a different line. This is the Dr. Beck line. So here, I'll, uh, my input into the logistic regression will not be the average of these words. Like even it has you know, king and comedy, I'll just ignore these green words. We'll only give it the red label, and let label will be like doc1. So this is the only input will be just the doc uh, label that comes in. So I give it all the words. Then I run gradient ascent to find out what's the best doc1, which fits it. What's the better red label that fixes it? And then I put this red label into logistic. Okay. Yeah, if you, if you look at the code, you'll find my details there. OK, I uh, the think there's another question in the back. Yeah. Uh -huh. So this thing completely ignores negation, so no graph. Yep. Kind of Antonyms are quite hard, and negation is quite hard. Um, and you can do uh, f phrases before that. If you have like not lab appearing a lot, there's an algorithm which will just see like, oh, these two words appear frequently together. Let's make it not underscore lab. And that will be a, like a one word in there. So if you do this, you know, uh, just uh, do underscore, if like concatenate frequent bigrams beforehand, then it will figure it out. That not, but it will think of not lab as a different word from lab. Uh, yeah, but intentional antonyms don't work that way, unfortunately. Cool. So I'll just, I'll just finish and then we'll ask more, more, I'll ask more questions in the end. So there's no neural magic out of the box, you know, and what are these models what's easiest for you to debug and tune? Like if I send a model to the client, they, you know, take some email they just wrote to, you know, their partner, put it in my model, and it comes out with some email and email me, like, why did it happen? It's so like, oh, you know, Google trained the model that way, you know, in the paper. It's not really an answer usually in consulting you can give them. Or like, you know, why does it, why does it think everything is comedy? You know, what can I do to make it less, of, of, you know, what can I do to fix this class of errors? And what's the easiest model out of all of them to fix that? And this is the easiest one, with this TF-IDF bag of words. My features are just words, you know, like adventure, adventurous, you know, love, planet. I can easily do them, you know, like, oh, maybe I should remove the word love, and then it will work better. Like, I can actually explain what's happening there. Everything else is black box and hard. So if it's up to me, I would just use TFDF all day, you know. And, but I, I don't get to give talks on PyData about TFDF. That's the only problem. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, but if it was up to me, I would use TFDF if consulting. If you don't need crazy accuracy and crazy tuning, then just use simple model, and it will be fine and be quite self-explanatory. Uh, cool. Yep. So this is easiest to debug and easiest to understand. TFDF bag of words. Um, model. Sorry, uh huh. Back. Um, I haven't tried with this data set, but it is much easier to do it with, than with something else. Yeah, I could probably get it to 57. Uh, yeah, if I play more with my features. And like, for example, if I 
downsample the comedy genre in training. That will give me already something, um, something better here. Yeah, I, th I think it's possible. But you can, the dat data is in GitHub. Like, if you submit a pull request which shows the FIDF beats everything, I'll be happy. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, I mean, there's still place for the banics in the world. Like, when you want sm some small improvements, you know, when you have gigabytes of data and, like, you know, a million of words, that would help a lot. Or if you want just some extra features to your exact, if you already have TFIDF, add more feature, maybe you get something better. Um, yeah, there's still a place for order beddings. Don't completely ignore this talk. <laughs> just, it's not, shouldn't be, shouldn't be like your first, you know, thing you go to. It's not the ideal baseline for this stuff. Cool. Um, yeah? Yep. Okay, well, that makes sense because they're testing. It's something you could get back after you've trained someone to work with. However, uh, practical applications, yeah, I mean, we can appreciate the artificial intelligence here, but it might not be nice if you put this in a recommendation service for a website, I can imagine. So, just out of curiosity for your experience, uh, how often do these word embeddings actually make it to production for such more enterprise purposes? Because there's a lot of interpretability risk, right? Yeah, but the. If you, for a search engine, they, if every time you need to you know, search for things which are, say, on, you know, related to dogs or like related to pets, and you, you, can, you can have different embeddings which for a dog, sometimes they can, they can return cats or they can return different kinds of dogs. So it depends on how you train it. Not just depends on the text you feed it, but also how big is your context. If you go far away, it will find cat, but if you go really close, you probably find just different kinds of dogs. Um, so if you have a dog and it turns, you know, lab and Rottweiler and things like that, that that's quite, quite useful in a search, um, in a search uh, scenario. Um, but you, I mean, it's a cl if, if you have a supervised task, you always have, you know, some test set and you have a classifier. And it's just a question of what, which features do you feed to the classifier? You know, do you give it just the counts of how many times the word dog appears or do you feed it a vector for dog? That's, that's when it helps. But if you want to do a supervised task, you have to have a test set, definitely. But it used a lot in classifying resumes, you know, like f uh, doing corporate uh, text search. Um, yeah, it's, it, has a definite, it has a lot of applications, definitely, in production. Yeah, there was a question, I think, somewhere. Here. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the stage of tuning. So mm -hmm. when, you, when you're tuning to get better accuracy, you not only just tune the classifier side of it, you also do tuning stuff. Well. Yeah, even though it's unsupervised learning, <laughs> but unsupervised learning, it's hard to find out how good it is. You know, it just has this objective function, you know, put the words that appear close together, together. Okay, but I don't care about words being together. I care about, can it tell me if it's a comedy or not a comedy? And so it's unsupervised. I have the supervised stage where I have a bunch of hyperparameters, and then I have a supervised stage later. So it's, you can put it all into a grid search, actually. Like there's a sklearn interface where you just like try different hyperparameters and find what's the best thing there. Where well, you train them all at the, at the same time. Uh -huh. How does um, this way of doing embeddings compare with doing T TFIDF and then putting it to SQDF and LSI? Uh -huh. I mean, how does it compare with that? There, that that's good. Like like T TFIDF and LSI or just you know bag of words and and uh, LDA. This is also pretty good. These are all unsupervised uh, techniques as well as, as word embeddings. And they've been around for like, you know, 10 years, 15 years, much longer. And um, I have this slide. They actually all do the same thing. <laughs> the, um, where is the slide? Yeah, let me show you. This is some historical. Because once you put it to an SVD, you're putting an embedding as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's all, it's all just dimensionality reduction, you know, just all the way for, to go from this, um, oh yeah, here it is, yeah. So there are many other ways to get a vector for a word. Basically, you, what do you start with? You start with a matrix, which is called a collocation matrix, co-occurrence matrix. I just have, you know, oh, you know, fox and jump appear in the same sentence 10 times. You know, the fans and folks appear in the same context, you know, 20 times. You just have this matrix, you know, have words on, on horizontally, words vertically. 
And this is, mathematics is really big. It's you know, a million by a million, just vocabulary by vocabulary. So from that, I want to get some smaller uh, representations. And, how do I f and to do that, I have to factorize the matrix. And Wartebeck is one way to factorize that matrix under some conditions. And there are other ways to factorize it. You know, like SVD, LSA, I can just have a matrix factorize it by, by SVD, as you should have been saying. You know, I can do LDA, which is a probabilistic way to do this factorization. Or I can do, you know, GLAV, Eigenwords, Wardrank, Warmbed, class text. Yeah. Um, there'll be, um, yeah, I'll, I'll be talking on Sunday about fast text and word drunk and word to vec if you want to know more about other embeddings. Uh, yeah? Okay, I'll have a question there. This is maybe a broader question, but overlay around the system turns back to the Cool. Uh, it seems to be working well for human queries, but I get um, managed with your own SEO issues to make it. Well, like, there's a nice paper about how to remove the biases from these embeddings. Like there's gender biases, racial biases, all the things. There's like a whole, in a very nice published paper, and you, the techniques how to remove the biases. You basically like say, this are the biases I'm looking for, please remove them from my model. Because you feed it the news, and whatever is in the news gets into a model, and then the model makes decisions and just perpetuates the bias, bias for that way. Huh? It's just called like removing biases from word embeddings. It's actually, I think it's in nature even, yeah. or science. So, 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 yeah. Actually, my question is sort of related to, to this. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. that actually captures uh, analysis. How, uh, is, is there some sort of way to uh, learn so about analogy? Analogies we didn't, you know, we didn't know before. We didn't know in advance to, to get analogies out of a, uh, of a dictionary of vectors, for example. Well, uh, I mean, if... Oh, what, what were you, you, you told just before? What uh -huh. Mm -hmm. What if I am looking instead for some sort of bias I still didn't know about? Yeah, that's that's the problem. If you don't know what you're looking for, you cannot you cannot take it out. That that is that is specifically the problem. Um, yeah, you have to define it before you can take the, that bias out. That is knowing they this pe this people they basically said that this uh, this word should be analogous. And this, like this analogy, for example, like with CO and CO, like that's that is a gender bias, and you should remove it. And this is specifically how you should adjust it to remove it. And they have a specifically positive example, specifically list of positive examples, and it's just quite hard to find out how good your unsupervised model is. <coughs> like you can have a list of, um, you can have a list of things like that, and that's what everybody in academia, you know, has been working with. And there's other data sets where they say like, oh, you know. Uh, wardrobe and wood are, are similar in this way, but actually wardrobe and wood are different in the other way because they don't have the same function and they have these different notions of s similarity. And that's what they have to deal with academia. And it's hard for them because they don't have real industrial problems. You know, in my case, like if a consultant says, you know, classify movies, I care about specifically the meaning for classification of, uh, classification of my movies. And if there's some bias in there, I don't really care because the, um, and for, unfortunately, yeah, like I, I don't really care because it's, if it's a bias in my, in my data set, all I need to do is get a good accuracy. If it's a bias if my movies are already labeled that way. And that's, that's how it gets, you know, perpetuated, <laughs> unfortunately. But the only way you can find out if your own model is good or bad is by a supervised task in the end, by this uh, kind of, you know, yeah, by looking at uh, metrics like this. That's the only thing that tells you if my model is good or not. Okay, uh, I'll take a question there. This, I mean, they say if you take Spanish Wikipedia and English Wikipedia and you align them by like king and queen and another like thousand points, then they're the same up to rotation. That's what they say. So you can just like rotate them, and then if it's something it's not in my aligned in my alignment, then I can figure out um, you know what what's the closest one, one in the other space. So yeah, it's, it's used for machine translation that way. The only problem with languages which are not English is the morphology. And yeah, morphology is really annoying. Because I, you know, run and running are two different words in English. It's okay. But like in Russian, like the run changes based on gender, you know, and yeah, like in Russian. Yeah, like in, you know, Portuguese, it's even, yeah, you have gen gen gender in Portuguese as well, for example. The, 
and that's that's the main problem with them is, is an analogies. Uh, sorry, the problem is morph morphology, how it changes. There's fast text, which has been published by Facebook uh, in August, and it deals with analogies better. But sorry, this is morphology much better. It's yeah, I can talk more about it on Sunday. <laughs> I'll keep, keep pitching this yeah, to answer to, to your questions. Cool. Um, more questions? Yeah. Yeah, in, uh, in a production environment, you know, you get data updates and you get to say you, you do the models, uh, how do you handle, you know, this kind of randomness? Like, if your model changes a lot every time you train it, just batting, you know, uh, every time you retrain it just with a fixed data set, that means you don't have enough data. It means you only have, you need to have much more data for it to stabilize. That's, uh, or have a smaller alpha. Uh, that's how you deal with randomness, but uh, it should not happen. Like for um, Doctorback, for example, we have a we have a test where you know I do I have Doc one which I obtained through training, and then I have Doc one which I infer using this gradient descent, and they have to be the same. And that's what we do as a sanity check of the model. So it just means we need to have more data. If you have this ju ju jumpy randomness, it means we have to have more data. That's the usual answer to that. Uh, Yeah, like cl close enough, like up to some epsilon. Yeah, but th that it will come up. But to use Vortavec, you really need like 500k words. It's the minimum. You know, you just need more than that. Yeah, it's for Vortavec. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe if you use like three dimensional vectors, you can probably do it for like, you know, 50 words. If you just use like, you know, if you only, only need to go is to go to three dimensions. But then you sort of lose all your meaning. And that way if you could probably do with TF IDF. Uh, like something much simpler would probably work if you have so, so few words in your vocabulary. Um, yeah, just more like if you want to go from a million by a million metrics to like 100 by 100, that might be tough. If you go to like 500 by 500, that might be easier. So it's just a dimensional interaction. Cool. We have a lot of time, I think. Yeah. Uh, we'll just well, okay. Uh, I've, is there anybody else who has a question? <laughs> uh, okay. No more questions. Cool. Just say, yeah. Thanks to you. We'll have an, another talk on Sunday. Find me on Twitter at, at Tiger Milk, or you know, come to us on GitHub. If you're a student, talk to us about the student program. Yeah. Thank you. I think we're done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.